Our Old Testament lesson comes to us this morning from Isaiah. Hear now the word of God. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there, and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing, Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. And from Luke. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. As I read this passage and thought about this sermon, Memories from long ago came alive. Memories that began shortly after I graduated from college. I had moved overseas to spend a year in the West Bank. I worked at a school for Palestinian girls. This was especially eventful and meaningful year for me, spiritually, emotionally, and psychologically. I loved working with those girls and my Palestinian colleagues were kind and supportive. I found the Palestinian people warm, gracious, and welcoming. It was easy as I walked along the paths that Jesus walked to imagine what life had been like at that time. The Hebrew people living under the occupation of Rome, paying taxes to foreign government, living under foreign rule, for me, living in an occupied land meant I never left home without a passport. We were frequently being stopped for no reason and having to produce documentation. These memories came alive as I read the story of the Magnificat because so much of Mary's life in and through my students. The passage we just read, known as the Magnificat or Mary song, is also known as a song of social revolution. Because in it, Mary sings how the mighty will be brought down and the lowly lifted up, the hungry fed and the rich sent out. It is an upending of how society has always been known. I'd like to share with you three stories this morning. 
of my time in the West Bank. They aren't easy stories to hear and they were even harder to remember. But for me, they embody this story, Mary's song. The first involved a student from my 10th grade English class. She had arrived in the middle of the school year from the United States. She had been raised most of her life there, but then she'd been sent back to marry a 32 year old cousin, which would happen at the end of the school year. She was miserable. There was nothing I could do to do about the arranged marriage, but I could help her have as good a year as possible, a school year as possible. For any of you who are or were teachers, you can probably identify when I say this was an exceptional class, not just in intellect, but more importantly, exceptional with their kindness and their compassion. A once in a lifetime class. It was easy to help integrate her into the class and with love, she managed to relax, enjoy the rest of the year as much as was possible. The next incident occurred while I was teaching an eighth grade class. The father of one of the girls came and told her she had to come with him immediately. He was a professor at the nearby university and the family had dual citizenship with the United States. He had been pulled from his class by the Israeli soldiers and told to gather his family. They were being deported that day. I don't know what his alleged misdeeds were. They didn't have to be much to get someone deported or jailed. For this young girl, her life was upended because they lived in an occupied country. She had spent much of her life in the West Bank. It was her home. With many tears, she gathered her things and said goodbye to her friends. The final incident I want to mention this morning again involved one of my 10th graders. One day, this student did not show up for class. She was one of my brightest and friendliest girls. It was not like her to miss school. Actually, it was not common for any of them to miss school. Soon word got around that she had been traumatized in the middle of the night, her home had been invaded by Israeli soldiers. Her widowed mother had at one time rented a room to a man, but he hadn't lived there for over three years. The soldiers were looking for that man. They broke down the door as they burst into the home. The five children were awakened by the noise and the yelling and had come running to their mother. A soldier grabbed my student and held a gun to her head and demanded to know where the man was. The mother was hysterical. She had no idea where he was currently at. She kept repeating this to them as they threatened to shoot her daughter if she didn't tell them where he was. Finally, they let my student go and left the home. My student didn't return to school for three days and hardly spoke for some time. One day she chose to write about this experience in response to some writing assignment I'd given them. We were close and I think she chose to write about it to me because I was a safe person with whom she could begin to process what had happened. I thought about those girls as I read Mary's song and thought about her life. She was a young girl betrothed in what was surely an arranged marriage. Her homeland was controlled by Rome. They were sent out when she was pregnant due to orders from the occupying government to be registered so that taxes, taxes could be levied against them. Hers was not a free life. Yet in the passage, we find a woman who finds hope in her situation. Um, she recognizes this as a blessing from God and gives glory back to God. She knows she will be remembered forever because of it, which must have been an exciting thought for her. And the blessing was not meant just for her, but for all of humankind. It was a blessing rooted in the promise of liberation and freedom. Mary was clearly learned in the Hebrew scriptures for the song and echoes of the prophets of the Psalms and the elements of the Thanksgiving prayer of Hannah. She knows the stories, the foretelling of the savior who will reverse the strengths of the world. The lowly will be lifted up and the mighty will be brought down 
the hungry will be fed and the rich will be sent out. I'm sure that for many people alive today, the thought of having a full belly or a warm place to sleep is as distant and remote as can be. But that is what is promised and Mary exults in that. She expresses hope in the future through the promises of God. An oppressed woman exults. For her, for her hope lies in the Lord and not in the decisions or actions of humans. I hope that we too can take solace in God's word when we are going through difficult times. But in what other ways does God give us hope today? Cornell West, a philosopher and political activist said, justice is what love looks like in public. Isn't that a great saying? But if justice is what love looks like in, pu in public, what does hope look like in public? After contemplating this, I decided that for me, hope looks like action. We are called to be the hands, feet, ears, voice, heart of God. And if we are the embodiment of God, then our actions can give hope. Hope comes through a 16-year-old girl, Greta Thunberg, sitting alone outside of her parliament building, protesting climate change, and now is the voice of both challenge to world leaders and hope to the youth in the fight against climate change, a voice that now resounds around the world. It is Scott Warren of Arizona facing prison, but living out his faith for giving water to refugees who are weak and dehydrated from their long trek through the desert in search of safety for their families. It is the deacons and church members who bring meals to someone recovering from an illness. It is a church family that provides goods needed by homeless families. It is the youth advisor who counsels a teen who doesn't feel he can confide in his parents. It is working the extra hours just to give the overtime money to church. So there are funds to help people in the community who fall just above the poverty line and so are unable to get any assistance. It is social justice committees at churches committed to helping change the systemic role, roots of racism and elitism. Hope is the nonviolent protest that Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. championed. Hope is faith in action. We must work in whatever way we can, individually and collectively, to bring hope to the hopeless. We need to address the systemic issues that cause wars, poverty, poverty, racism to continue. We are called to action and our action brings hope to others. I'd like to tell you one more story from my time in the West Bank. I became good friends with a Muslim man two years younger than me. He was my best friend there. Osama worked at his uncle's souvenir shop in the old city. When I had a day off or some free time, I would just hang out with him and watch as he interacted with the tourists. One day, two women came in. They were Americans. They had with them Bibles. In talking with them, we learned that they had felt called by God to come over to preach the gospel. They said they originally thought it, that they were to come to convert the Jews, but after they arrived, they decided that their calling was to convert the Muslims. They talked with my friend who graciously listened. They gave him a Bible and then left. As soon as they were out of the shop, he blew up, angry that they would come like that, offering nothing but words and a book. It did nothing to change the reality of his life, the oppression in which he lived. As a former Presbyterian missionary, I'm proud of the work that the PCUSA has undertaken in mission, both here and abroad. For we not only talk about God, but we witness God through our actions of teaching, healing, walking side by side, even when the road gets rocky and the way is not clear. The PCUSA puts out statements that condemn actions taken by governments that affect God's people negatively. We Presbyterians live out our faith in a multitude of ways as a national church and as individual churches, by reaching out to lift up the lowly, to carry the downtrodden, we are spreading the good news of Jesus Christ and instilling hope to those who need it most.
And I would like to add that there are people and organi organizations in Israel comprised of national Israelis who are also living out, living and leading by faith, who are standing up in solidarity with the Palestinians and who work against human rights violations and seek solutions to the conflict. Most, if not all countries need at least some moral, ethical correction for actions undertaken for harm done to the weakest and most oppressed members of society. And I believe it is our duty to stand up in faith to be that voice against oppression, to be that voice of reason, love, and grace. The Magnificat is a song of revolution, but it is also a song of hope. It is not a call to arms, but a call to faith. Mary truly is the mother of a future and a hope, for it is through Jesus Christ that we find our future. We find our hope. God began a good work through the birth and life of Jesus and will complete that good work when Christ our Savior returns. Hold on to that hope and live out that hope, sharing it with others as you are called by God to do. Amen.